Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you today. And uh, whatever the effect of Ityantri Prabhu's introduction of me on you, it has the effect of having totally confused me now. <laughs> because as I said, that if after that kind of intro introduction, I was thinking what topic will be a good follow up for that introduction. So, <clears throat> I'll speak on the topic of from love of power to power of love. From love of power to power of love. And the theme I'll take it is that love of power is because we want to control things. And power increases our capacity to control things. Whereas power of love is the power of accepting and transcending. So basically, I'll talk this in three parts. And after each point, I'll give you some time. And it will be nice if you could reflect and share some point that you found relevant or something which you like carry home with you or you would want to share with someone else, something that spoke to you. <clears throat> so, the three points is, first is, how everything that we do is at a conscious or subconscious level driven by the love for power. Okay. Second point is that actually what we all long for is not power but love. And the last point will be how bhakti gives us access to the power of love. So let's begin with the first point. The first point is that all that we do is motivated by love of power. When a baby is newborn, that baby soon discovers the power of crying. <laughs> the power of crying is that whoever is around, the caretaker, the mother, the father, they will just drop everything and come running to me. And there are, even among, there are some babies, every baby is different. There are some babies, even when they are in their crutches, you know, they, they are in the, on their back, not able to get up also, not able to crawl or walk also. At that time itself, they are looking up and thinking, when am I going to take control of the house? <laughs> so, every, all babies cry, but different babies cry with different volumes, intensities. <laughs> And sometimes, some babies cry, not because they are in distress, but just because they want some attention. Mm -hmm. And they cry just so that the mother will stop neglecting them and come to them. So, for that baby, in the growth, initially, crying is simply a response to distress. But after some time, crying becomes a tool to power. <laughs> not a response to distress, but a tool to power. And similarly, as we grow up, we discover different tools to power. <coughs> now, the, why, why the tool to power? Because we all want to have things work out the way we like. Say, so baby may just want, not just want food, may want attention, may want affection, may want to play, <coughs> whatever. So as we grow up, our specific needs may change. But always uh, the power that we have to fulfill those needs is lesser than what we feel we should have and that's why we all try to increase our power in different ways as we grow up we study now studying and getting marks <clears throat> in our colleges is not just a tool to a career it is also a tool to power over others. You know, I am the number one. Everybody respects me. So I get people to be subordinated to me. And as we form relationships also, within those relationships also, we seek power. So once a marriage counsellor was counselling uh, various groups of couples, and then he told them, all the men, all the men, 
who are controlled by their wives come on the left and all the men who control their wives come on the right so all the men except one came to the left only one man came to the right then he asked him oh, you really control your wife no my wife told me to come here <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> ultimately every relationship is also a power struggle not ultimately functionally in every relationship we are trying to control by <clears throat> gaining power and we all over a period of time try to discover what are the things that will give us power <coughs> for some people <coughs> For some people, it may be their wealth. For some people, it may be their looks. So some people, it may be their fame. Some people, it may be their <clears throat> particular birth family or nationality or whatever. So we all are actuated by this uh, love for power. And by that, we hope we can fulfill our desires. Now, wealth is also a great tool for power. We want wealth so that we can fulfill our desires. We can fulfill our dreams. <clears throat> In the Mahabharat, there's the example of Duryodhan. Now, love for power itself is natural. It's not necessarily unhealthy. We all are, from the Bhagavad Gita's perspective, we are all parts of Krishna. And Krishna is the supreme being. So he's the Parameshwara and we are all Ishwaras as his parts. So the controlling tendency is just integral to who we are because we are parts of Krishna. So it's not that we want to control that's bad. It's that for what purpose we control that is important. Just like if somebody becomes a parent to some extent they have to control their children at least till a particular age. And that control is to be used for a constructive purpose. When somebody becomes a spiritual guide, then they discipline and control their subordinates to some extent. But that is also for a proper purpose. So this uh, seeking power itself is not bad. Mm. Say some, if you say somebody is power hungry, that is a very negative word. Mm. That somebody is power hungry means manipulating, backstabbing, doing whatever it is to somehow gain power. So that is a word with a definite negative connotation. But in general, to leverage our strengths is a much more positive way of saying the same thing. But we all want to know what our strengths are and we want to leverage those strengths, the best capacity. So whatever we are doing, we are all in one sense seeking power. And this tendency is itself not bad. It is for what we are using that power. We have love for power, but for what are we using it? Arjun, he discovered in an early time in his life that he was phenomenally gifted in archery. And then he leveraged that power to become the best archer of his times. Bhima realized that his strength was not so much archery, it was mace fighting, it was physical prowess. Now Duryodhan, on the other hand, when he grew up, at that time, he was initially the apple of the eye of the whole Kuru assembly because at that time Pandu had gone to the forest and whether Pandu would have sons or children or not that also was not known and even if he had children whether they would come back or not because Pandu had retired that was also not known so he was the center of attention for everyone and he got what we could call in today's times as an entitlement mentality <coughs> many of the younger generation, especially those who grew up in the West, in reasonably well-to-do families, their children are often sent to have this entitlement mentality, where they just think I'm entitled to this and that and that and that. So he felt I was enti I'm entitled to attention, I'm entitled to affection, I should be the center for everyone. And then suddenly the Pandavas came back because their father passed away unfortunately and then because they were new actually attention shifted to them 
and not only were they new they were much more cultured they had they were virtuous <laughs> from birth itself but along with that they were also uh, they were also brought up amongst the forest sages and they were the sages were brahmanical sattvic people so as compared to duryodhan who was quite arrogant the pandava was very very virtuous and suddenly he found the attention and affection shifting from him to them so he started envying yudhishthir because of his position he was the eldest and he could very well become the next king he started envying bhima for his strength and over a period of time as arjun's archery became clear became a archery skill became clear he started envying arjun for his archery <coughs> and he started envying nakul and sahadev simply because they were pandavas <coughs> So there is in his eyes they were guilty by association <laughs> <laughs> so then after that he started seeking power by unholy means he tried to poison bhima he tried eventually to have the pandavas burnt alive he tried to have the gambling match in which he tried to dishonor the uh, dispossess the pandavas of all the wealth and eventually even the attempt to disrobe draupadi that was more out of power than out of lust <coughs> it was he just he wanted to show the pandavas how much power i have over you and how much i can humiliate you so <coughs> i was at a conference in chicago on in america basically on spirituality and society so uh, i was talking afterwards with some experts so there was this uh, expert the spiritual from other tra- another tradition and he was making this comment that when men try to violate women it is not so much because of lust it is because of power if it is simply lust they could just procure the fulfillment by paying a little money but they want to dominate and control and that Uh, try to abuse that power so it can go the a hunger for power can go in very horrendous directions and you know if somebody wants to oh, say generally somebody wants to commit a crime a violate a woman or something like that, generally they will try to abduct a woman and in some private place they will do it but if somebody does that in public that is scandalous but imagine if somebody comes and does that in a police station It's completely outrageous. So what Duryodhan tried to do was like that. In the Kuru assembly means it is the all the people who are meant to protect the law. <coughs> In front of them, he was doing it. So how brazen it is! How outrageous it is! Mm-hmm. Like in India, these terrorist attacks happened recently, and the whole nation is on a boil because of that. Now it is. It is just many reasons for that. But one reason is that it is not just civilians were killed. It is the police were killed, and they they came right into the police ranks and rammed a vehicle. So what happens is that it's not just the wrongdoing that is committed, but where that wrongdoing is committed and to whom it is committed, that can increase the magnitude. So Duryodhan, his hunger for power made him do such reprehensible things. so the, the, we all have a love for power but that love for power can go dharmically or it can go adharmically and if it is not channeled properly it can make people do horrendous things and they don't even realize it in the bhagavad gita krishna says how there are people who delight in doing wrong in 16.13 to 15 he says that asaumaya hatah shatrur hanishye cha paranapi ईश्वरो अहम अहम भोगी सिद्धो अहम बलवान सुखी आढ्यो अभिजन्वान अस्मि कोन्यो सिसादृशो मया यक्षे दास्यामि मोदिष्य इत्यज्ञान विमोहितः सो फर्स्ट ही सेज दैट एवरीबॉडी वांट्स वेल्थ द डेमोनिक आल्सो वांट वेल्थ ए आई आई डू दिस स्कीम आई गेट मोर मनी आई गेट डू दैट स्कीम आई गेट मोर मनी इदम अद्य मया लब्धम इमम प्राप्से मनोरथम इदमस्ति इदमपि मे भविष्यति पुनर्धनम सो दिस 
in one sense this uh, wanting more and more wealth is just natural but the extremes to which they go that is if somebody comes in the way of their wealth they're ready to eliminate that person also they destroy that person and not only do they kill someone but they delight in how clever i am how clever i am that i could eliminate this person and i could get away with it so the idea here is that there there is weakness and there is wickedness weakness is something we all have there may be greed there may be anger there may be lust there may be arrogance whatever now that sometimes the impulse comes up and we do certain things so that's weakness so afterwards we regret why did i do that so basically we have our intelligence which is like a inner curb but sometimes when the impulse comes up the intelligence is knocked over and then we do something wrong that is weakness so weakness makes us hot headed you know hot headed in uh, literally in hindi se dimag garam ho gaya hai so when people's head becomes hot they can't think clearly and they act impulsively often destructively however weakness is very different from wickedness in wickedness the person is not hot headed the person is cold blooded <laughs> cold blooded means that as i said in weakness the person has some impulse and then they do something wrong by overpowering the intelligence temporarily and then afterward they realize hey that's a bad thing i shouldn't have done it but in the case of wickedness it is the systematic the intelligence is not just sidelined that intelligence is perverted that means the intelligence is used as a tool by their impulse so somebody may just go to a shop and they see something and they get a urge and they do some shoplifting and take it and go away and then they regret i should not have done it that is just a impulse but somebody who goes with a gun and plans out i'm going to do this and i'm going to do this i'm going to rob that bank and if it's a fully planned out that's not that's not weakness so where there is weakness there can be forgiveness where there is wickedness if there is forgiveness then that forgiveness will be seen as weakness by the other person <laughs> <laughs> and said this point somebody has wickedness like the kauravas when the pandavas offered a peace proposal they saw that as weakness you are afraid to fight with us so what happens is there's a categorical difference between weakness and wickedness so love of power all of us have and sometime in the seeking of power we might give in to some weakness and do something but wickedness means that love of power makes us cold blooded calculative cunning heartless and thus we end up doing terrible things so uh, whatever we do at one level we are motivated by the love of power mm -hmm. say if i am speaking right now now if somebody can speak well they get power over their audiences now this is a power which some people have more some people have less but some people can use it for good and some people can use it for bad one of the most powerful orators of the last century was hitler but he used his orational skills to cause one of the first destructions in the world so whatever abilities we have we get power by that but depending on how we use that power that can either lead to a constructive effect or a destructive effect so that is the first point i was talking everything that we do is motivated by love of power so any reflections any comments okay i'll tell you why i'm doing this mm -hmm. so uh, when i give classes often my classes tend to be very analytical so there's one devotee in india who told me that aapka class sunna matlab 1 ghanta dimag ka kasrat karna hota hai so one hour you have to do some exercise of the head so these reflections are time when all of you can have a break <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course we can refresh also so um, if any point struck you please feel free to reflect that
Yes. So, Prabhu, how do we... Oh, no, 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 no question. Oh. Reflection is not a question. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have questions later. <laughs> Reflection is at some point it struck you, which you felt was relevant, uh, which, as I said, you may want to share with somebody else, which you found very, very uh, significant. Yeah. Yes. Yes, love of power is, uh, it can come out of emotions, it can come out of, love of power can also come out of love. You know, when a mother, if the child is going somewhere here, they're running away, baby, mother wants to control that child, don't go there. So, the mother needs some power over the child. Otherwise, if the mother doesn't have sufficient power over the child, then how can that mother discipline or protect the child? So, it can come from positive emotions also. I was uh, at one, uh, I was at one mediation session in America and the two devotees, you know, so one of the devotees started by saying, ah, I know you are very angry with me. <laughs> so other devotee says, no, I am not angry with you. So I thought, they are you know, pacified. But this devotee, what he said was just, this other devotee just started boiling because of that. He said, love is an expensive emotion, sorry, anger is an expensive emotion. You are not worth it. <laughs> so, <laughs> sometimes the people come not for resolution but for aggravation. <laughs> so, um, if there is a uh, desire for power also you know if there is anger at least mean there is concern over there there is no anger at all that that could mean there is no concern there is no emotional investment at all in this case it was not like that it was just an attempt to aggravate someone <laughs> but it is like that sometimes so yes reflect uh, so love for power can also come out of love it's a good point any other point okay yes the moment when you were speaking, I'm not sure how could you relate this to the situation, but I was remembering when Indra Dev Guru was uh, kind of like showing when the go uh, Krishna Bhagwan uh, picked up that uh, Govardhan mountain in the hand. So I could relate to that incident. And he was in that ego, the Indra Dev was in ego and it you to show that why the Vrindavan Vasis are not praying me and then the flooding happened. I hope, I mean, mm. can I relate it to this incident? Definitely. Because in entire um, maybe see he was seeking power, or maybe he wanted to show that how he's a bigger entity than Lord. Hmm, good example. To it? Excellent. That is very good example. So Indra had that love for power, and when he felt his power being challenged or threatened, yes. instead of having worship for me, you are worshiping a hill. It is outrageous for him. So he. Uh, you don't understand how powerful I am. Then he tried to exhibit his power to break havoc on them. So, that's a good example of abuse of power. When the love for power becomes excessive, then when that power is challenged or threatened, we abuse the power. And he abused it in a very grievous way at that time. Good example. Thank you. So, I'll move on to the second point. The first point was that whatever we do is motivated by love for power. And it can be that power can be used constructively or destructively. Now, at a deeper, second point is that at a deeper level, we are all seeking love. So, we want power so that we can get love. Although, sometimes that may become so deep rooted, that may be so deep that it may not even be uh, apparent. Sometimes when uh, we see all of us need affection, need attention, need appreciation. And these three things, affection, ap attention, appreciation, they're basically broad ways of saying we need love. So attention is just somebody should hear me, somebody should uh, give me some time. Appreciation means somebody should 
and uh, 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 praise the good that I am going through and appreciate it's not just a matter of ego. It's also that somebody appreciates what all the struggles I am going through and understands me. And then affection is a positive emotion. So we need all these three things. Now, we all seek to get it in various ways. <clears throat> in one of the disadvantages of uh, of the increasing prevalence of technology is that we become most of us live in cities where there are millions and millions of people and we become more and more aware of our smallness we we realize that if say if you're going in a street and say in a city like Mumbai in the local trains there are millions of people out there on the streets so what happens is that the technocentric materialistic society reduces us to a number just one more number in the statistics of the world and then we just can't bear it we, we can't endure the fact that I am just alone, insignificant, unconnected so in the past we had joint families then we had nuclear families and now even that nucleus is split and we have protons, electrons, neutrons <laughs> <laughs> orbiting around <laughs> so it's, a, it's quite a uh, very loneliness inducing world and in this world we all seek attention hmm? I have a friend in UK so he is he is now become a psychotherapist. So I asked him that, isn't it difficult you sit all day and hear people's problems? He said, yes, it's difficult, but it's not all that difficult. I said, why? He said, because most time, even people come to a psychotherapist, they know what they are meant to do. Either they know the solution or they know there is no solution. <laughs> <laughs> that means say if uh, if some problem is incurable hmm, somebody has lost a limb or somebody has lost a loved one or something like that so, some problems are just you cannot do anything about it they, they know there is no solution or sometimes they know what man, they are meant to do hmm. but when people come to psychotherapists it's more than a solution actually they need just some attention somebody to speak to somebody who will hear them non-judgmentally so society is so lonely that people just need people to hear someone to hear them so we may in front of uh, the world parade as ourselves being very powerful very successful very um, very happy but inside there is something which is someone who is very insecure, who is fearful, who is lonely. And that someone is always seeking attention. And that attention may be sought in different ways. Some people, ultimately what they want, they want affection. So they may gain a lot of wealth and power and they may, they, they, the power of wealth they may brandish <coughs> in order that people will be attracted to them. If somebody has uh, attractive looks, they may parade those looks so that somebody will be attracted to them. So we are all ultimately looking for affection and when we are looking for affection, looking for love, sometimes what happens is there is a deeper need and there is a surface need and sometimes we may get so caught in the surface need that we may entirely forget the deeper need. The same people who say uh, seek seek love and affection so I was at a, a at a conference on spirituality and addiction in Connecticut so we're talking with uh, the caregivers over there because the caregivers themselves get stressed because what happens when we interact with people we need a certain level of predictability in the other person sure. so that we can function say right now all of you are sitting and able to hear if suddenly somebody started screaming over here 
और इफ यू हैड ए फियर एट द पर्सन नेक्स्ट टू यू वुड सडनली गिव अ बिग स्लैप यू कुड नॉट फोकस इज इट इट इफ आई हैड अ फियर दैट दिस चेयर माइट कोलैप्स राइट नाउ आई कुड नॉट फोकस सो फॉर ऑल ऑफ एस वी नीड फॉर फंक्शनिंग अ सर्टन लेवल ऑफ प्रेडिक्टेबिलिटी एंड द मोर अनप्रेडिक्टेबल द पर्सन इज विथ होम वी आर डीलिंग the more anxiety is there so those who are in mental health care centers it's not that the people who are there are are like constantly mad it is that sometimes they have moments of lucidity and sometimes they have moments of insanity and this doctor was telling me that if somebody is constantly insane it's easier to deal with them <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay not audible okay thank you for telling mm. so you will have some moments of clarity and moments of inaudibility <laughs> yeah so what happens is if there is no predictability in the other person then dealing with them becomes very stressful uh, so so what happens with these people who are mental health care providers they come under a lot of stress because the people who are under them it's just so totally unpredictable so at one moment the person may be very calm and gentle and nice and the next moment he might become like a madman to be something totally insane so what happens with such people is that they we we have the physical world around us and we have our mind where there is another world mind also has its own pictures its own images its own conceptions and usually there is some connection with the mental world and the physical world so right now you may be sitting and hearing you also have some dreams some aspirations some desires but you know okay for the time being you can put it aside and focus on this for some people they get interact so much with the mental world that they forget the physical world hmm? say now in a few months the cricket world cup will come up so maybe i don't know in australia how much cricket mania is there is there a lot yes it is there so in india sometimes in the cricket and the streets you might see some young people they are walking on the streets and they are bowling <laughs> or they are batting <laughs> so they are imagining that they are the next virat kohli or whatever <laughs> so what is happening they are so much caught in the mental world that they don't even they're not even aware i'm walking on the street so all of us we have our mind saying something to us but if you get too caught in the mental world and get disconnected from the physical world that is where it becomes a big problem so even people who appear to be very unloving very hard very stern very <coughs> rough what has happened is if they also still need love but maybe because of not having got that love repeatedly in the past what happens is they defend themselves from further hurt by putting on a facade that they don't care only and in their dream world they might have some fantasies you know somebody will care for me somebody will love me and somebody will uh, understand me empathize with me so that need is there in everyone so the point i'm making is what we ultimately want is love and even if somebody seeks power in such a way that they uh, seem to not care for anyone like in schools uh, sometimes some kids are bullies now you might say bullies are exactly opposite of love they have no love for anyone they just want to hurt everyone else but often if you see in their lives they probably maybe the parents didn't pay them attention or they did not get love in a way they felt loved and now so they are seeking power to dominate others and so even their so the so the need for love can be expressed in such a way that for others there's no love being seen over there and even for themselves also they may not realize that they are actually seeking love so some people who are extremely hard hearted you could say heartless in fact they also have a heart but 
the, the strategy that they choose takes them further and further away from the need that they are trying to fulfill. Say somebody starts taking uh, alcohol or drugs, then what happens? In that chemically induced high, they can ima imagine relief. They can imagine whatever they want. They can imagine life will be very good. But unfortunately, because of that, they end up being unable to act lovingly in the real world. So they end up being unable to connect, take responsibility, <coughs> express love, because they just lost. So sometimes our external action, what its connection is with the inner need may be very difficult to discern for others as well as for ourselves. But ultimately the point I'm making is everybody is looking for attention, affection and appreciation. Ultimately everybody is looking for love. And ultimately, from the bhakti perspective, we understand that we are souls who are parts of Krishna. So we are looking for Krishna's love. But we just don't know about it. And when we understand this, if philosophically at least we begin to appreciate this, and then through introspection, through purification, we start understanding it better. But ultimately, no matter how unloving a person may appear to be, they are also seeking love and we can't change others much <coughs> but we can introspect that when we get angry so when we yell at someone quite often the problem is not just a short temper yes short temper you can say it is there but why is the short temper there say now i gave a seminar in Mumbai and I'm doing a retreat in Brisbane on this topic of burn anger before anger burns you. So I talked about why somebody may get angry. Say a mother may yell at a child. And you may say that the child did not do the homework or child did not keep the house clean or child made a mess of certain things. Now, now the mother gets angry because of that. Now what is the reason? It could be that the mother has had a hard day that day and then this last this was the last straw for the mother it could be that the mother feels that actually nobody in this house takes me seriously everybody takes me for granted and because of that he wants to show her power and then she is it could be that the mother may feel that if my child doesn't listen to me that indicates that i am a failure as a parent and the insecurity of being a failed parent may lead to the yelling. So the yelling is not just because of short temper. Short temper is there. But why the short temper there? So ultimately the idea that I am an insecure parent, uh, I am not a successful parent, I am a failed parent. That is, that is also actually a distorted need for love. <clears throat> okay, maybe I did not offer love properly to my child. Maybe my child doesn't love me. So. When we have this vision, then a lot of uh, understanding of other people's behavior and our own behavior can start happening. Whatever we do, we are seeking love. Some people just, you know, spend hours and hours playing video games, especially among uh, teenagers. Uh, or some people spend hours and hours watching movies. Now, why is that? They are also you know, seeking affection in that virtual world, in that cyber world. Maybe they identify with the character, the hero, or the heroine, the star player in the video game or whatever. And how that, if that person gets attention, appreciation, affection. So everything that we do, it's, uh, if you are doing something which is uh, unhealthy and we just say this is because of, oh I don't have willpower, I don't have determination it's not necessarily like that it's often a misdirected need for love so that was the second point <coughs> i was going to make that whatever we do even our, we are seeking power ultimately we are seeking love we want power so that we can get love although sometimes we may seek love in a way that may drive love away from us but ultimately we are all seeking love okay any reflections on this
so i'll move on to the last point then the last point is about how bhakti helps us to move from so power of love i said power of love so love of power then love and then the power of love the power of love means that actually krishna loves us eternally the bhagavad gita say the surudam sarva bhutanam it is the well wisher of all living beings that krishna is sometimes one of the words used for him is bhakta vatsaka that is the lover of his devotees but prahlad mar in the seventh canto say that krishna is that means la vishnu is krupana vatsaka he is not just the lover of devotees but even the lover of people who are materialist people who are sense uh, people who are just self centered material even them he loves so because he loves everyone that means he loves even us <coughs> and he is there even out in our hearts and because he is sarvasya chaham hriday san nivishto is present in the heart of every one of us with us as our closest friend closest companion closest guide and to the extent we can start at least intellectually appreciating his presence and his love even if we don't practically experience it at least intellectually appreciate it to that extent we can access the power of love so what do i mean by accessing the power of love uh, and before that what do i mean by intellectually appreciating we all what to speak of feeling god's love for us we may even sometimes ex- doubt doubt god's existence or god's benevolence does he exist does he care i i prayed for this i didn't uh, i didn't get this i prayed so much for this but it didn't happen so we may sometimes feel like that but that happens because for each one of us now we are all at various stages in our spiritual growth and on the ultimate perspective we are still like children now a child may say i want this toy and the toy does not got then my one child says to the mother or father i want this toy i want this toy i want this toy and the child doesn't get that toy and the child says to the mother to the parents you don't love me okay the child can't child reduces the parents love to that particular toy now for all of us as we grow up we all also have particular things that we get very attached to now we may say these are very serious things they are not toys yes they may be serious from our perspective but from a child's perspective a toy is also a very serious thing <laughs> <laughs> so the thing which you consider very very important right now if i years down the line 10 years down the line it may not be that important for us so it's not that we don't take these serious things seriously it's just that uh, we often uh, reduce god's love to a particular thing that we want if i get this then god loves me if i get this then krishna exists and krishna cares otherwise krishna doesn't exist krishna krishna doesn't care so that's how because of that we may not perceive krishna's love but it is intellectually we have appreciate that actually uh, there are so many things are right in our lives one basic principle we can say that if we are alive there is more right than wrong in our lives mm-hmm. if we are just alive uh, if we consider so many most of us probably are 28 25 30 35 that age group some of us are 45 50 but so many people die even before they get to the age that we are at mm-hmm. even if we consider financially so many uh, most of us will probably be in the top 10 or top 20% of the world top top 10 15% of the world also there are so many people living in far with far less so there are many things right in our lives and many of the things that are right in our lives we did not do much to set them right no so every day we eat food and then what happens is we get energy by that eating food but 
we don't do anything to actually transform that food into energy. The digestive system is just that. The only time we think of our digestion is when it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if we just look, there are so many things right in our lives. <coughs> there are so many things right in our lives. And this is a, uh, to access this power of love, this is a very healthy habit. Now, every day, you know, when we wake up and before we sleep, just thank God for three things in your life. In the same three things, it can be three different things, but just thank them. And especially if that day we have experienced something good because of that, uh, connected with that, we appreciate for that. That's wonderfully uplifting. So what happens is by this, we at least intellectually, even emotionally, we can't change our emotion immediately. A child who is attached to the toy cannot suddenly give up the attachment. The emotion will still be there. So similarly, we may feel emotionally very strongly driven towards certain things. And if they don't come, we will feel bad about it. But at least intellectually, yes. I would love if this works out nicely. But even if this works out, doesn't work out nicely, that doesn't mean that it's the end of my life. You know? That thing not working out may cause me some pain. We may have to live with pain, but we don't have to live in pain. Live with pain means pain is a part of our life. Live in pain means pain becomes the whole of our life. Mm -hmm. Our life becomes contained and covered by pain. So when our consciousness gets reduced to one thing, oh, you know, oh, I wanted to get this job, I didn't get this job, my life is over. I wanted this relationship, it didn't work out, my life is over. I wanted this, it didn't work out, my life is over. So when we, we reduce our consciousness to one particular thing, then we may will live in pain. But when we think about the things that are good in our life, what are we doing? We are expanding our consciousness. Our mind seems to have some kind of perverse attraction towards problems. That means whenever we have some problem, the mind just keeps thinking about that. Why did he do like that? Why did she speak like that? Why this? Why this? And then just our consciousness gets shrunk to that one thing. But if we consciously try to count our blessings, then we expand our consciousness. This is there. I'm not denying this. I'm not trivializing this. But although this is bad, there is so much right in my life. Then we intellectually appreciate Krishna's love. And then accessing the power of love means, which is, I'll conclude the class with this, that when we practice bhakti, and not just practice bhakti in a ritualistic way, but practice bhakti for <coughs> connecting with Krishna. So within the activities of bhakti, we find out something which helps us personally connect with Krishna. So for some of us it might be kirtan, for some of us it might be shloka recitation, for some of us it might be just beholding the deities of the Lord, for some of us it might be associating with a particular devotee, for some of us it might be doing a particular seva. We find out something which directs our emotions towards Krishna, <coughs> which connects us emotionally with Krishna, then by that we will access, access Krishna, we'll connect with Krishna and we'll start accessing Krishna's law. This is a little subtle point. Say, uh, what I'm saying here is that say our emotions, feel, we feel hurt, we feel angry, we feel deprived, we feel depressed, our emotions on this side. With our intelligence, first you understand, yes, this is bad, but this is not the only thing in my life. There are so many other things which are right also. And I appreciate those right things with my intelligence. And by that, I stop feeling that bad. We have to live with pain, but we don't have to live in pain. Hmm? Now, after that, so if there is this inner battle going on between emotion and reason, between mind and intelligence, <laughs> then First, at least we need to have the intelligence ready to fight. Otherwise, what happens is, uh, the emotion takes the intelligence along and we just keep, as they say, go on a pity party. Just feeling sorry for ourselves. So, pity party, you know. Not a kitty party. <laughs> pity party. <laughs> so, at least so my hearing classes, by like coming in association of devotees, that intelligence gets nourished. And then we can we can fight, at least resist the emotions when they start hurting us. 
But in general, in the battle between emotion and reason, it is very difficult for reason alone to win. So we we make emotion also a ally, a partner in this battle, not the opponent. So we find out something in bhakti that helps us connect with Krishna, that makes us feel good. Just hearing some kirtan, just hearing some talks, hearing some katha, just taking the arshin of the Lord. So that makes us feel good. That makes us feel calm. And by that we connect with Krishna, not just through reason, but also through emotion. Yes, this emotion, which I, this thing went wrong in my life and I'm feeling bad about it, that's there. But it's also good. So at the emotional level also we connect with Krishna. And after we do that, gradually what will happen is the connection with Krishna will become bigger. And as the connection with Krishna will become bigger, we'll find the hurt becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. The hurt will be there, it may not go away, but it will not hurt us that much. And by the power of love, by the power of Krishna's love for us, by the power of offering our love to Him, by connecting with Him, we will find ourselves getting transformed. Prashanta manasam hienam yoginam sukham uttamam upaiti shant rajasam brahma bhutama kalmasham Prashanta manasam hienam The mind becomes peaceful. <coughs> yoginam sukham uttamam The yogi experience of sublime happiness. The 6.27 in the Gita. Upaiti shant rajasam all the agitation that is there in the mind, the rajas goes down. Brahma Bhautama Kalmasham We start realizing our spirituality. So this is what happens to us when we connect with Krishna. Arjun was in the battlefield of Kurukshetra and he was very agitated. How can I fight against my elders? How can I fight against Bhishma and Drona? But when he heard the Bhagavad Gita's message, as he heard the Bhagavad Gita, it was not just intellectual hearing. It was intellectual hearing, of course. But Bhagavad Gita spoke not just to the head of Arjuna, it also spoke to the heart of Arjuna. And it connected with his heart. Towards the end of the Gita, Krishna's heart comes out. Krishna's love comes out. He says, after he completes Sarvadharma and Pratyaj, just surrender to me. Then he gives a Falashruti. Falashruti is, what is the fruit of hearing? So first he says, if somebody shares this message, with everyone, and that person is very dear to me. Now somebody may say, well, sharing is very difficult. Now who's going to go and speak Bhagavad Gita to others? I can't do that. So Krishna says, okay, if you can't share, at least you can study. If you can't give the Bhagavad Gita to others, can't take the Bhagavad Gita to others, just study. So it's like say, somebody has fallen in a well, and Krishna, somebody from outside offers a rope. You hold on to the rope and come out. So that's like Krishna saying, you just share, you will become very dear to me, you will come to me. Of this there is no doubt. But then somebody says, actually if I hold on to this rope, my arms will start paining. How can I hold on to the rope and for so long while you pull me out? So then the person from outside says, okay, don't worry, I'll, I'll take this rope and uh, make a knot. So you just tie this knot around your waist and I'll pull you out. So Krishna is like second level is giving. If you can't share, you just study the Gita. Like tie the knot. So I, you don't have to take the effort to climb out. You don't have to climb out to hold also. I'll just pull you out. So that's the second level. But somebody may say, actually, if I tie the rope around my waist, my waist will pain so much. I can't do that, you know, if you're going to pull me. So, somebody may say, I can't even study the Gita. And Krishna is the third level. You just hear the Gita. First he says, Adishyate cha yemam dharmyam samvadama vayo jnana yagyena tena ishtasyamiti mehmati Those who hear the study this message, they are worshipping me. But then he says, if you can't do that, then chudu yada pi yona rajas. Just hear about this message. They will also get liberated. They will also get elevated. They also get purified. So it's like, the person says, okay, you know, I will take this rope out and I will tie a tub to it. And I'll send the tub inside. <laughs> just sit in the tub and I'll pull you out. So Krishna is saying, you just hear this message and become purified. 
Unfortunately, we sit in the tub and then we turn the tub around. <laughs> <laughs> and we tend to fall out, unfortunately. <laughs> but, so Krishna brings out his love by saying, you know, I'll make it as easy as you want. And then he says, Kachi Deita Shutam Partha Toyeka Grena Chetasa Kachi Dagyana Samoha Panashtaste Dhananjaya Oh Arjun, have you heard attentively? Have you understood? Has your illusion been dispelled? So Vishwanath Kritakur says over here that Krishna is asking Arjun that if you have not understood anything properly, you can ask, I'll repeat, I'll clarify. Arjun Krishna is concerned that he understand. That Arjun understand. And then what happens is Arjun's doubts are completely dispelled. His mind is completely pacified. Nashto mohasmati labdha Tatrasadhan maya chita sthitaus migata sandeha Karishe vachinam tava He becomes pacified. So the Bhagavad Gita describes, although it's a war in which you could say that they are activated by love for power, they want power over their opponents. But actually the Bhagavad Gita is talking about the power of love. Arjuna was overpowered, overwhelmed by the occasion. He couldn't fight. But through the message of the Bhagavad Gita, he understood Krishna's love for him. And that love gave him power to face the difficult service that he had to do, to face the challenge that he had to face. Similarly, if we hear about Krishna and appreciate his love for us, then that will give us access to the power of love. No matter how difficult be the situations we are facing in our life, if we turn towards Krishna, this problem is this big, but Krishna is much bigger. And if you turn towards Krishna and access his power, then just as Arjun overcame his discouragement, we can also overcome our discouragement and march ahead in life. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on this topic of from from power of love of power to power of love. So first point I said how everybody is what are the point? What if everybody is seeking power? Everybody, our various actions are uh, so are driven by the love for power. From babies crying to somebody seeking marks, to somebody seeking wealth, looks. By that we want power, and we can seek this power for a good purpose or for a bad purpose. So people who are uh, dharmic virtuous, they use power for positive. Purpose. Like mother uses power to discipline and care, to care for the child. And when we have weakness, then we occasionally misuse the power. We become hot-headed. But when we have wickedness, then we become cold-blooded and we deliberately, in a deliberated way, mis misuse the power. And that was the case of, so Arjun leveraged his strength to become a great archer. But Duryodhan manipulated and tried to destroy the Kaurava, Kandavas so that he could get his get power. That was love of, that was the first part, love of power. The second part was, second point was, anyone remembers? Yes, we are all seeking love. Whatever we do, we are seeking love. So even if somebody acts like a bully, or doesn't seem to care for anyone at all, that person is also seeking love, but in a very distorted way. And uh, I talked with, uh, somewhat about mental health problems where we can start living so much inside our head and in our head some script is running and we are getting attention, affection, appreciation in that script. Although we appear very disconnected or crazy in the world, it's like somebody playing cricket in their imagination and their hands moving in a particular way. So similarly, some people might be acting like uh, very suspicious, uh, very suspicious and cold externally, but that is the way they are in their minds protecting themselves and when we understand that we are all seeking love then we stop uh, labeling ourselves negatively so if somebody is short tempered it's not just short tempered it might be some insecurity internally when we understand how we are seeking love to a particular unhealthy behavior then we can act to rectify that behavior and lastly i talked about the power of love so bhakti gives us access to krishna the power power of divine love First, we understand that Krishna loves us through scripture, using our intelligence. 
there is there may be many things wrong in our life which may feel that krishna doesn't care for us but instead we look at the many things that are right in our lives and by that we start we start expanding our consciousness from its obsession with a particular problem or a particular a toy like object that we are not got we may have to live with pain but we don't have to live in pain and then after we intellectually appreciate krishna's love for us then we emotionally connect with krishna so that the inner battle is not just against reason between reason versus emotion but we also get emotion partly on our side some activity which connects us with krishna we do that regularly and by that we can move closer and closer to krishna and then by that inner connection with krishna gradually the magnitude of the hurt or the pain or the deprivation will start decreasing and lastly i talked about how by the power of krishna's love we each one of us can get especially empowered that whatever difficulties we may face in our life krishna's love is that he makes himself accessible to us just like he made himself accessible to arjun and the last three was i talked about how increasing is increasingly easy ways of accessing us <coughs> if you share or study or just here so like a bucket like a rope being lowered a rope with a knot being lowered and a rope with a tub being lowered so like that in mercy is being available more and more so when we appreciate and connect with krishna's love then no matter how much difficulty we might face by the power of love we will get whatever power we need <coughs> to face life's difficulties and move forward successfully thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna, hare krishna. So any questions or comments yes please you just spoke about how everybody is seeking attention or kind of like affection yeah um, or in our head but mostly um, what i see or what i do or what i see most of my peers uh, attention on social media which is a big issue like i feel like for myself mm. that okay i'm not getting something outside let me grab the attention on social media and do something mm. and it's kind of very addictive because you become like a passive thinker you don't really think about actively mm. so how to uh, you know get you get rid of that sort of addiction and uh, okay. more real world okay so how do we deal with say a lot of obsession in social media just for the tension yeah i would say for attention it's not necessarily a bad thing as technology has just become a part of the world today so i once gave a class on internet in the three modes <laughs> <laughs> so it's the ultimately what a technology we have it's a reflection of the people who are living in the world so just as people in the world are in the three modes so the inter- digital world also internet world is also in three modes so there are say for example there are uh, online help communities in the sense that if you have some problem with your phone phone yeah i i have some problem with the mac i go to apple communities or somebody has android community android community and you ask question people give answers there's so many places and there, there are websites where you ask some core is a website where you ask question people give good answers so technical questions uh, informational questions so it's like a like a physical neighbor might give some information or some help to another physical neighbor so we have a digital neighbor giving help to another digital neighbor so it's there are certain like wikipedia in many ways it's sharing knowledge in a democratic way with everyone so there is much in the internet which is in goodness but there is much more that is in rajas and there is much also that is in tamas and because if we consider that most society mean society as we Uh, live it today is largely in rajas and tamas so overall the content on the internet will be much more in rajas and tamas than sattva but the difference with respect to the digital world as compared to the physical world is and in the physical world to go from sattva to tamas requires some physical effort say somebody in the library and they want to uh, drink they have to physically go to a bar so it requires some effort but on the internet you might be reading wikipedia one moment and just click one button and you might be completely tamas somewhere so the it is not that inter- the social media is entirely bad 
it's just that uh, ultimately depending on the mode we are in we will connect with that kind of social media if we are in sattva we will connect to the sattvic content on the, social, on, the, on the internet or on the overall online world if we are in rajas we will connect with what is in rajas if we are in tamas we will connect with what is in tamas but if we get this tamasic or rajasic urges to indulge in them is much easier that's why some caution is required <coughs> so broadly speaking for dealing with this there are two three things which could be done one is that if we have some if if it is a serious issue for us then if we have some close friend then we can candidly talk with them about whatever issue we are facing and then just uh, the technical term for this is accountability partner accountability partner means say if somebody has a tendency okay i want to read something serve something for half an hour but half an hour becomes six hours <laughs> then if we have somebody who whom we can share this with and they they shouldn't be judgmental they should be broadcasting it to the whole world <laughs> they have to choose discreetly but if you just have that even that small deterrent oh you know if i do if i waste time on this i will tell this to this person that itself can act as a good deterrent so what happens is we are here the mind is here and the digital world is here so what happens is that if it's only we and our mind with the digital world then the mind will completely captivate us but if there's someone else other than that then that helps us a lot having somebody who can monitor broad not in the moment to moment basis but on a broad way also what we are doing and if they can't monitor at least we share with them then that helps a lot in keeping things in perspective the other thing is that it depends on what works for different people so for some people it just works quantity that every day okay more for half an hour or 30 whatever 45 minutes or whatever i will look at this or even if i have to keep looking at it throughout the day maybe i'll make it not that every 5 minutes i'm looking at it maybe every one hour if i have to look at it one hour every 3 hours every 5 hours so some way we create some reg- regulation so that regulation is sattva mm-hmm. so i was with one devotee Mm, I told him that we were, we were corresponding by emails, and he said, "For next one month, I won't respond to emails." I said, "Why?" He says, "I am taking in Karthi ka email fast." <laughs> 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 so okay, then I asked him, "Is this going to? Uh, is this going to really help you, or is it only going to make things more difficult for people who want to contact you?" <laughs> So then he said, "No, I'll be accessible by phone if somebody wants." But he said that uh, that was his plan. So basically, some way we can create regulation. What way works for us? It may be in terms of frequency. It may be in terms of duration. It may be in terms of just accessibility also. Like sometimes some people just don't take a phone with you some in some places, whatever. So some way we create regulation. That also helps. And third is that try to have a clear purpose. Uh, why am i using this it's if we are have that purpose clear then if we go of course also we will realize it see if we don't have a purpose very clearly in our mind say i'm feeling a little bored let me see if there's something interesting if we start using the internet to just relieve our boredom then the problem is that uh it's uh, we will find that okay this one thing did not relieve my boredom so much so second thing third thing fourth thing fifth thing so if we are surfing just to relieve our boredom better find some healthier way to do that mm-hmm. maybe have some nice music maybe have something offline that you can read something um, some maybe some devotional movies or some edu- some education stuff whatever so generally seeking relief by surfing it is dangerous because it because there is no limit to that is to give a practical example is that is if you are studying and you are studying in library and just next to that is a canteen and you just studied for <coughs> one hour you need a break and then you go to the canteen and there are dozens of friends over there 
So one friend, second friend, third friend, fourth friend. So instead of uh, our study, we getting a break in our studies, we get a breakdown of our studies. <laughs> so just as if you want to just a break, we won't go into a crowded place where 100 people will approach us. We just go for a brief walk or maybe just stretch ourselves. So in general, surfing the net to just get a break from boredom is an unhealthy idea. Now we might need some interesting information from the net also, but if we have a purpose clear, then when we start getting diverted, we realize it. If we don't have a purpose clear itself, or if the purpose itself is not a very sound purpose, then it becomes very difficult. And so in this, it's like if somebody is a little drunk, they understand I'm drunk. Isn't it? I should not drive a car now. I should ask, maybe I should take a lift or ask somebody else to drive. But when they're very drunk, I'm not drunk, I can drive. <laughs> They can't even speak properly, but they think I can drive. So like that, what happens? If we do not have our purpose clear, we get lost and we don't even realize we are lost. If our purpose is clear, at least we realize I'm lost. So those three things, having an accountant <coughs> partner, having some kind of regulation and having a clear purpose of why we are using this. Those things that helps in uh, keeping things under control. Okay. Thank you. Yes. And he said that um, that Krishna gives us an easier process that we can hear uh, Bhagavad Gita. Like it is said that um, the man the man gives us the duck, so we can sit in that and then the man goes. So is there more easier? Way? <laughs> oh God! Is there a more easier way than sitting in the tub? <laughs> That's what devotee at the time of initiation, in the at time of initiation we take a vow to chant a particular number of rounds, <coughs> chant sixteen rounds. So one devotee asked his spiritual master, Maharaj, in my chanting, what I am doing, you know, it is it is not going to be pure. So sir, chanting sixteen rounds. Can I hear Prabhupada's Japa of 16 rounds? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so spiritual master told him, actually Prabhupada is doing everything else for you, just chant. <laughs> <laughs> so ultimately, you know, it's sitting in the top means see, ultimately to go to Krishna, it's not a matter of being easy or difficult. Ultimately, what Krishna wants to see is our desire to connect with him, express through some tangible action. So if you just do that, so for sometimes, in some, for some people, in certain situations, certain activities may be difficult. So it is possible that certain certain bhakti activities may be difficult. But we just in our situation, we have a desire internally to connect with Krishna, and we express that desire in some tangible way. If we do that, we will be taking steps towards Krishna. So, ultimately, sitting in the tub also means just that only. Okay. Very <laughs> good. Any other questions? So, thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Tai Gaur Premanande. As was mentioned, 